there's something about uh, great days and what you do with the content of that day once you leave these walls. Is it back to the day job? Or is it actually I've got so much that I'm going to share with my colleagues and share and um, with uh, maternity services in terms of how we can just nudge the dial on improvements for those who we serve. And I, I consider my role to be a role of servitude, um, serving uh, women in their families, serving the profession. And so I'm just going to really, for the next 15 minutes, give you a tiny snapshot of uh, We Are The Change. Whether you feel it or not, let me tell you, <laughs> If I'm the change, then you have to be too. We are the change. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a little snapshot. And uh, I'm so used to baby noise that I tend not to hear it. So as we get the noise, I'm going to go just that little bit higher. And, uh, and I might actually come and get baby. <laughs> a girl or boy? A boy. Fabulous. Great. Okay. And he's why we're here, right? So we are the change. Um, so first of all, I just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you to you for everything that you have done um, in this space. We've had two years, two years of a time that you never, ever could have imagined. Two years of a pandemic. Who could have imagined that we would have lived through something like this? But we have, you have. And I just want to say a huge thank you for everything that you have done. I've stood in solidarity with some of you. Um, that's me and my PPE. Um, at the Rosie in Cambridge, having um, completed an amazing water birth during the pandemic with PPE. <laughs> it um, is quite a challenge, but nonetheless, I've stood in solidarity uh, with you. But um, more significantly than me, a huge thank you to you. And you'll see me thank you throughout these pages because we have a good story to tell. So, as England's first Chief Midwifery Officer, my ambition is for England to be the safest place in the world to be pregnant, birth and transition into parenthood and for staff to feel um, respected, valued and invested in. And the operative word is feel. Feel valued, respected and, in, and invested in because our data will tell a story, our survey findings will tell a story, but the real story sits with you. How do you feel? How can you be? And there is something about feeling um, valued, respected and invested in. And of course, to be the safest place to be pregnant, birth and transition into parenthood. All the bits in the middle, I'm not going to go through, but there is something about leadership. There is something about perceptions. School children choosing midwifery as a career of choice. Um, once we get people in, can we keep people in our profession and if we can't why can't we and of course the public perception and the press perception of who we are and I don't know how some of you feel about the um, panorama program that happened last week um, it was quite a difficult watch um, naturally families that were bereaved that told their stories and equally, every health professional watching that program who thought, I go to work to be the best that I can be. And it was quite a difficult watch. But I'm here today to say to you that we need rapid learning. And with rapid learning, we change our actions and we're on the road to improvement. So beneath all of the boxes in the middle, we have the government ambition. And some of you are well familiar with this, that... Um, to be the safest place, we have an ambition to half the rate of stillbirths, neonatal deaths and maternal deaths and serious brain injury from a 2010 baseline by 2025. So a 50% reduction by 2025. And just keep an eye on the 20% reduction by 2020. So that is our overall ambition and my um, uh, uh, mission um, as the Chief Midwifery Officer. However, on the 11th of March 2020, I don't know how you felt, but I certainly know how I felt. And my worry, my huge worry, was how are we going to cope in maternity services? How are we going to do it? 
um, I had, you know, I didn't have a panic attack, but I was <laughs> bordering on one thinking, you know, how are we going to cope with this, particularly as the news reported the impact in terms of mortality. And we had the sickness, the absences, the death. We've lost some of our colleagues and we stand today owing them this privilege because we're still living to continue to serve the people that use our maternity services. The fear, I had so many messages of fear um, and anxiety because this was a real and is still a real issue, even though we've come through um, several waves. We had to suspend some of our services because we wanted to keep everybody safe. But in suspending our services, we had the press challenging us about not um, supporting uh, families to have their partners with them during their pregnancy journeys. And many of us tried, but the social distancing, we were just conflicted on every single side. And my narrative always is, is that, of course, we want to do the best by everybody, but we had to suspend. We had the visiting restrictions coupled with the headlines. Do you remember the headlines? Week on week in the press, um, we have um, the MTP, the Maternity Transformation Programme, the long-term plan, having to suspend reporting on some of these really key initiatives, mental health, perinatal mental health, it's in our long-term plan, pelvic health, it's in our long-term plan, having to pause reporting and the implementation because our systems were having to cope with the job right in front of us, and that was providing safe and personal care to women and families. Uh, also, uh, in relation to the pandemic, it limited um, our capacity to transform against the backdrop of the Health and Social Care Committee. Uh, Matthew Jolly, the National Clinical Director, and I, so midwife and doctor standing hand in hand, we had to give evidence at that select committee about safe maternity care. Um, and that was autumn of 2020. Uh, we've had the, um, the Af um, Afghanistan resettlement program supporting Afghani women who were pregnant and birthing, how scary and frightening that was for them to come to a strange country, being um, quarantine hotels, um, bridging hotels, and all they wanted to do was to birth their babies in a safe place. And we, you, supported them to make that a reality. We had the fuel crisis, and one of the things that I'll always remember on Twitter, at JDB, community midwives have no diesel, do something. <laughs> um, at JDB, Afghani woman birthing airside, what are you doing? You know, and it was just re it was a really interesting time for me as a leader, because I listen to everything that comes my way, because I want to be the best that I can be. But as a consequence, um, that actually meant that uh, it was really challenging because you can't be um, uh, moving forward at pace um, for every item that comes your way. And when I got to the DM at JDB, there's no water on my labour board. You know, I, I, it made me think about where is everybody else? Wh where are your leaders, your peers, your managers? Um, where are your services? Why isn't there any water? Can somebody give somebody a glass of water? You know, if we haven't got, you know, if we're short on breaks, you know, tea rounds, biscuit rounds, somebody order pizza in, but let's love and value our people because that's how you end a shift. And short, being short of staff, having health professionals saying, high five, didn't we do well? Even though you might have been compromised because you've valued each other. There is something quite fundamental about value. Then we have the vaccine hesitancy. We have the conspiracy theorists. Um, sadly, because I was encouraging women to have the vaccine, not sadly, but I was encouraging women to have the vaccine. Sadly, I was then trawled and I had pictures of thalidomide uh, babies. I had uh, pictures of needles in my neck, blood on my hands. I had, you know, for everything that I've had, I know that you've had triple that, quadruple that. So um, the vaccine hesitancy, the media, uh, women being critically ill with the Delta variant, end of life care, sadly we lost many women. And of course then the plethora of reports um, on the right. And I always go back seven years to Morecambe Bay because seven years ago, 44 recommendations from Morecambe Bay 
And then we have Ockenden, six years later. What has happened in those six years? There is something about sustaining good and it is a concern of mine. And then all the rest you can see for yourself um, there. The key point about that is that we are the change. We have to be the change. We are the change to make um, some of these things, um, uh, turning these things into learning and improvement journeys. Nonetheless, despite all of the above, we move forward and we're delivering key commitments and we have maintained momentum throughout the pandemic. So some positive news. Um, we have funded um, through a 95 million pound investment. I know it's not enough, but it was better than what we had the day before. So we've been able to fund 1,200 more midwives, 100 more obstetricians. We've had um, an increase in funding for neonatal nurses. We continue with continuity of carer. We're moving forward with not caution, but safely. So with continuity of care, we're asking for building blocks to be put in place prior to further rollout. But nonetheless, we are at 13% of true continuity of care. Uh, we've got pelvic health services, 44 implementers um, that are established. And why have we got pelvic health implementers in the long term plan? Um, we refer to this initiative that is very much needed for women because one in three will have urinary incontinence within the first year post-birth, one in 10 fecal incontinence and one in 12 pelvic organ prolapse. That's why we're having to do something about it now. And for those of you that are as old as me, if you recall the women's health physiotherapists that frequented our postnatal wards and then kind of weren't there, this project is something about getting that back in the system. Perinatal mental health. We have perinatal mental health outreach services that um, will be phenomenal across England, least of all because in instead of having to meet the threshold for IAP services or be so mentally ill that you actually meet the threshold for a, a, to see a psychiatrist, these Outreach clinics will provide you with the opportunity for timely referral in. But the most significant and exciting, one of the most significant and exciting things about this, the perinatal mental health, is, is that partners, partners will be allowed to, um, or supported, I should say, supported to seek help as well. And that's the first time in history that we'll have that. So partners, be they male or female, um, they will be supported to have support for that. Saving babies' lives, you, you know the history behind that. And the rest, I think, you can really uh, see for yourself. So we've continued. We've continued. Also continuing, at the start of the pandemic, I think there was myself as Chief Midwifery Officer. I was nine months, nine months in post and then the world went upside down and, and back to front. Nine months. I recruited two deputies. So there are two deputy chief midwifery officers um, in England, substantive appointments. And I could have said, right, focus on the pandemic only or continue to run alongside it. I chose to run alongside it. And now we have a chief midwife in each region in the NHS in England. A chief midwife. So that's seven regional chief midwives, northeast, northwest, Midlands, east of England, London, southeast, southwest. Each of those chief midwives have a deputy chief midwife. And to make that team complete, each of them have a regional obstetrician. Now that is what we have as the infrastructure for our amazing maternity family. And I vowed on the first day of being a chief midwifery officer, I would start looking out for the next one. And so there is something about all of us availing yourselves of this career opportunity, this infrastructure that we've set out. It hasn't been easy, but we have it for our profession. So there is something to think about for your futures. Um, moving on then, um, so when I said you are a part of the change or be part of the change, I just want to share this with you. This is because of you. You have been a part of the change. Now, what we're looking at, this is not JDB's data. This isn't NHS England's data. This is, these, are, these data are from ONS. 
And these data are telling a really compelling story about the stillbirth rate, the lowest ever on record. We are ahead of the government um, uh, uh, target, 25% reduction. And, uh, and that is something to be celebrated. So it's thanks to you and your teams for making that a reality. So despite the negativity, the data is telling a story. We must be doing something right in England for us to have the lowest stillbirth rate on record. Now, of course, COVID is going to create some challenges around this. But um, uh, nonetheless, neonatal mortality rate, again, um, we're moving in the right direction. Maternal mortality rate, again, we're moving in the right direction. Brain injuries, um, not doing so well. We are reducing we have much to do in that regard. And there is a project that's been supported by the um, DH um, to enable that uh, improvement to be accelerated. And then, of course, the inequalities, which is music to my ears. The gap is reducing for inequalities in health outcomes. So are you a part of the change? Yes, you are, because the data tells a story. It tells a story. So thank you to each and every one of you for um, contributing to these great outcomes. However, however, data, it does obscure the human experience. Of course it does. And, um, you know, one maternal death, one stillbirth, one neonatal death is one too many for that family. So we hold on to that despite the data. We need, we need the data, obviously, but um, there is something about um, recognising that data obscures the human experience. And you know that because at the coalface, you are dealing with that on a daily basis. But thank you. you we don't say thank you enough. Thank you for making these data a reality. And what this looks like, this is only since um, a 12% reduction since 2013. So we've got 2019 data. So a little bit of lag in relation to the last, last slide. But some of you um, think, feel and understand in actual numbers. And this is why I wanted to include this slide, because it's really important for you to see the numbers in numbers. This is what you have done, you, you and your teams. So every single time there is something negative that comes your way, remember the data is, is telling us, is showing us that we are making tangible improvements. But for that one neonatal death, stillbirth or maternal death, we know that's one too many. In relation to the equity story, however, we know that there's the disparity in relation to maternal mortality, in relation to neonatal mortality, if you are black, Asian, uh, mixed ethnicity, or socioeconomically disadvantaged. And I'm gonna just pause there for a minute. Um, I, uh, uh, last year, we had four babies in my extended family. So four babies. Um, it's 2020, wasn't it? 2021. 2021, yes, we had four babies. But the four babies were uh, godchildren, nephew, niece. So Nottingham, Manchester. Two in Nottingham, one in Manchester, one in London. Four of them. Auntie Jackie, you can imagine. Auntie Jackie, Auntie Jackie. And I was just willing the you know, let's just get, let's just get to the end of this, you know, let's just get to the end of this journey. One of them, all babies are happy and well, all mums are alive and well. One of them, however, went into a hospital at 17 weeks gestation and was bleeding. Um, uh, she um, was sent home and told to go home and miscarry her baby. I think she was nearly 18 weeks gestation. She was given a leaflet and sent home. Um, her husband had the wherewithal to call me. I could hear some screaming in the background and um, I uh, uh, asked him what was happening and he said, you know, we've been told to go home. She's, I won't mention the name. We've been told to go home and miscarry the baby um, and she was uh, bleeding. And I um, rang the hospital, concerned, and uh, I had a conversation 
And I then called her back and said, get in an Uber right now. Forgive me, the black cabs. Get in an Uber right now and get yourself back to the hospital. Um, nine months later, she had a, a suture removed. Uh, seven months later, she had a suture removed. Eight and a half months, she delivered, uh, had a baby in a pool, her dream birth, and the baby is now 10 months old and doing well. Now, um, what she said to me, and this is really important in this equity space, what she said to me was, Auntie Jackie, do you think they said that to me because I raced into hospital with my scruffy tracksuit and I wasn't suited and booted and they judged how I looked and um, the colour of my skin? Now, you know, of course I said no, I said no, you know, them, you know, and of course I'm going to stand in solidarity with my profession, but in the back of my mind, I thought if she hadn't have made the call, her cervix would have just continued to dilate and she would have um, lost the baby. So there is something about listening, listening to ensure that we can redress the balance. We can do lots of things in relation to inequality. We can have the, the, the policies, the guidance, stick into protocol. But if we don't listen and then act, we are not going to get the outcome that, number one, the woman deserves and expects, and number two, um, that life will never breathe, breathe life. So to, to reduce that inequity gap, we have um, these things on the table, this equity guidance that was published last year at NHS England, uh, a publication from NHS England, and this guidance will be the skeleton for hanging everything on in relation to equity. And we expect to see changes. We also have the pledges that we've made um, to women. So if you haven't seen these guidance, then do have a look at them. They will be busy, the, the, your LMNS, your local maternity network system will have this and will be driving this through uh, provider services. A really, really key document. Um, of note, however, I just wanted to, in the middle of the negative stories, I just wanted to, we haven't moved on on the slide deck, but yeah, um, I just wanted to share with you, despite some of the negative stories, if you haven't seen your CQC survey for this, for, um, this published this year, for, for last year, then have a look. Despite the pandemic, women are telling us that they've had positive experiences during the pandemic. So what does that say about you? That says that you are doing a phenomenal job. You must be, because our greatest assets are the women. It's what women and families, women birthing people and families are telling us. And they've told the CQC that. I mean, there are obviously some um, uh, data that tells the opposite story, and that is women didn't feel that they could have their partners with them. And we know the reason why in that regard. But these are really compelling reads. And I hold on to things like this because it reassures me that if the women are saying this, when we, then we must be doing um, something right. So each of you from your unit have your own personal CQ, well, your unit's um, CQC survey data. So please do have a look at that and encourage each other and yourselves. We are moving in the right direction, even during a pandemic. So in relation to workforce challenges, and this is the nuts and bolts, some of the things that you are, have been anxious about um, when you go on a shift and the numbers aren't there, you know, Delta, Omicron, I'm not quite sure how that felt for you, but it couldn't have been a good feeling. So what have we been doing? I mean, there are so many things, but I've just pulled a few out of here and I have to give credit, actually. This is the slide of Jess Reed, Deputy Chief Midwifery Officer. It's not mine. I stole it from her pack. Um, she has, she's the lead for workforce. So I've talked about 1,200 more midwives, 100 more obstetricians. Now, we are recruiting 500 from overseas. Now, before you throw the tomatoes, about overseas recruitment. I understand the moral challenge. I understand that. Taking the best from countries that need their best. But what I will say to you is these people, and I've spoken to some of them in, in, um, in, in some of the African countries and some of the European countries, they are not working as midwives and they want to. We're giving them an opportunity to work in their first love. 
Many of them are unemployed. They can't provide for their families. We're giving them an opportunity to do that. And I'm not saying that we squared the moral circle, but there is something about giving opportunity. So our international recruitment drive is going well. Felipe heads that up and he's doing a phenomenal job. We have 200 that have been offered and we've got about 400 applications that are in process. And that is good. And hopefully we'll be getting more. Uh, the digital maternity, uh, this was in better birth several years ago. 45 million isn't enough, we need more. But what we want, and this is what Baron, I feel like um, I'm quoting Baroness Cumberlege now. She's so passionate about this. She wants women to pick up their iPhone and see their maternity records and have dynamic dialogue with their health professionals. And that's how it should be in 2022. Uh, retention, we're taking note of that. Do you know that student midwives are voting on their feet? They're qualifying and they are um, thinking, do I want a job here where my preceptorship programme is only a month? Or am I going to travel 20 more miles and have a year preceptorship programme? I would do, I would do that. You know, we need to think about what we're offering. So we want uniform preceptorship programmes across England in, in, um, that, that has synergy with the NMC preceptorship programme. Uh, there are so many things. Working with partners to address uh, morale concerns in midwifery, and, and that is a phenomenal programme that is really trying to support uh, um, staff morale, uh, job satisfaction, feeling valued, etc. Uh, the PMAs, if there are any PMAs, a shout out to you. Thank you. Thank you for every. Are there any PMAs here? Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you for everything that you are doing. Um, I know it's been hard and that's why we added in that psychological boost for you because you're having to pour out to others. And I know that's been challenging. Um, and we're training more PMAs. A big woo-hoo woo for maternity, I can't say that, a big woo-hoo for maternity in England. Why? Because we developed the AEQIP model and the PMA role. And our nurse colleagues, I'm going to say this again, our nurse colleagues during the pandemic saw how good it was and they have invested in thousands of PMAs, professional nurse advocates. And now our allied health professionals want their advocate too. And when I developed that model, I remember thinking P something A, so that professional, whichever profession, advocate. So medics can have their one, allied health professionals, that's how it was designed. And I was delighted. And I like saying it, our nurse colleagues are in our terrain. And that's fantastic. That's testimony to you and to us. So um, well done to that. MSWs, we've really got to develop our MSWs, um, aligning them with the HEE competency framework. They need a career structure of their own. I mean, you can see it all here. The, Pan 7, the Band 7 support has been phenomenal. Um, we have given monies to every trust in England in this last year for them to recruit a Band 7 midwives. I've said, look at your retirees. Look at the people that have left the service. Offer them a Band 7. Here's the money to do it and tell them to come back and handhold. Because you know those who left, the ones that are very wise, the ones that can do 20 things at once, the ones that you can lean on, the ones that trained you and I. You know, let's bring them back and get them to handhold, to help with retention and recruitment. That money was well used. We have testimonies of midwives who have said, if it wasn't for that midwife, I'd have left midwifery. But she had the time to sit with me and hold my hand. We are trying to get a letter out. You've heard it here. I'm going to get into trouble now. I'm always on the naughty step for something, but there will be a letter going out to the system telling your services that the Band 7 monies will be recurring into 22-23. So that's a good thing. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there on this page. Just a point about bullying and harassment because this is real, I've heard it, I have enough DMs, messages on every single platform that I can never keep up with about bullying and harassment. It has no place in the maternity family and we will stop it. Now I know there's been many, many interventions over the years um, to try and get into this space, but um, I would say, and I'm gonna name them, we have Amanda Burley, 
um, hashtag say no to bullying, some 4,000 strong uh, pe uh, Facebook page, um, uh, 4,000 4, people um, that are members of that uh, uh, Facebook page who have concerns that have been escalated to me. Uh, we have the March for Midwives on the 21st of November last year, the lead for that, um, ex uh, sharing concerns. And we have the Cheryl Samuels um, Change.org petition. That petition went into number 10. She clocked up 150 something thousand signatures. Some of you may well have been signatories. Um, all those concerns from those three people and the concerns that I had as C. Mido have been pulled together and the Right at the bottom of the page, we have a National Maternity Health and Wellbeing Task Force. It's, it had its second meeting um, this week. It had its inaugural meeting a month ago. And this task force will influence the curve of history. There are so many things that have happened in the bullying and harassment space. But as far as I'm concerned, when I read testimonials of students, of junior midwives, of senior midwives, of midwives who are talking about racism and discrimination, male midwives sharing their concerned, concerns, uh, midwifery lecturers, researchers, all through our professions, anaesthetists, obstetricians, that is live today and we have to stamp it out. So this task force will be around for, I chair this task force, it's going to be around for a few years because this must stop, this must stop. Um, in relation to ch you being the change, and I'm just coming to an end now, there is something about, um, and the slide will change in a minute, there's a time lag, you being the change. By the way, this is the baby whose mum was told to go home and miscarry at 17 weeks. Um, she's a lot bigger now, I have to say. But this is our time. And if you don't believe it's your time, ask yourself that question. If, is it your time? Is it our time to be a part of the change? And if it is, what, what has your contribution been? What has it been? It's a rhetorical question. Ask yourself that. Can we do nothing? I could have done nothing at the start of the pandemic in relation to building an infrastructure, but every time, every morning, I thought about the maternity family. I thought about the student midwife that might want to one day be the next chief midwifery officer. You know, I thought about those students in schools that are thinking about midwifery as a career of choice. Do nothing or do something. And these are rhetorical questions. Do little or max out on what you can do. Do our best. Do what's right. These are rhetorical questions for you. And I know which side of the coin I sit on. And some of you who have heard me speak on several occasions, you know that I cannot, I just cannot. I really tried to take this slide out, but it stays in because I just love it. And I have to read it. It's Kamala Harris. Of course it is. My daily challenge. And if we can transpose this into the world of maternity into you, into where you're at. My daily challenge to myself is to be part of the solution, to be a joyful warrior in the battle for the soul of the country. And I actually translate that into the soul of midwifery, the profession that I came into 32 years ago. My challenge to you is to join that effort. Let's not throw up our hands, and there are many people that throw up their hands, when it's time to roll up our sleeves. Because years from now, years from now, this moment will, it will pass. And our children and our grandchildren, if you haven't got children and grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, your French children, will ask, they will ask, where were you when the stakes were so high? They will ask us, what it was like. And I don't want us to just tell them how we felt. I want to tell them what we did. Now that's straight from Kamala Harris. It's not me, but I just love that quote. There is something about the battle for things that we can see and the things that we can't see. But as we are in it right now, we are a part of the change and we can do little or nothing, or we can do something. I'm one of those that rolls up my sleeves. But I will candidly share with you, as I believe I am an authentic leader, when I get out of bed in the morning, I too want to do a great job and I'm energised. And on some days, I have to admit, 
Everywhere I turn, I am knocked off my perch. Everywhere, everywhere. And at the end of the day, I think about you. I think about women, people, uh, birthing people, babies, families that are using our maternity services. I think about those that are on night duty, those that have had good shifts, bad shifts, those that haven't had breaks, those that have got hypoglycemia, full bladders, tired feet, no diesel, no water, whatever the situation is, I think about you and that helps me to move on to the next day because the next day is always different. So I roll up my sleeves and that's what I try and encourage with the team that work with me. And it's not easy because we're all human beings, right? And we all have families and people that rely on us to be for them. And our profession sometimes can be all consuming. And I leave you then um, with uh, uh, this. Um, and, you know, wherever you are in our architecture, um, in our system, in our maternity service, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, small, medium or large, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to light another candle. Just that smile. That smile, just that one smile to somebody who's always a bit grumpy. Just that one smile. Just that one, not hello as you race past them, but hello and listen. You know, you don't want to hear that, you know, my, you know, my house is falling down. You know, my husband's leaving me. I'm in debt. You know, you don't want to, you don't really want to hear. But actually, if you ask, how are you? Be prepared to listen. You'd be surprised. And just remember one thing one thing but you know it doesn't take very much it doesn't take very much to light somebody else's candle and we are at a time we've got a torrid year coming ahead um a really really hard year we've got um Ockenden 2 reporting on the 22nd of March and we know what the, what's going to happen in relation to that we have got the East Kent Review, a review into maternity services at East Kent. Bill Kirkup, who did the Morgan Bay report, is down in East Kent. That will report around the end of June. We have Nottingham reporting its review at the end of the year. And, you know, and I looked at this year and I thought, is this a year for, you know, this is our time? Yes, it is. But we've got to ride the storm for each of these reports because we are a part of an amazing family. Our profession is the envy of many because for most, for most, we are a part of a miraculous journey. Of course we are. So what we have to do, and I know I sound like an autocrat now, but we have got a tough year. What we have to do is light some candles. Let's not lose any midwives because they feel demoralized by the press. They feel demoralized by what's happening within their maternity services. Let's light the candles. Let's speak the narrative. Let's go to the right person that will make a difference. Nobody should suffer in silence, nobody. We don't want to lose anybody this year because of these reports. So I leave you with that. Please go and light somebody else's candle. Metaphorically, of course. Thank you.